Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all currently. My name is Hannah Rose. I'm calling in today from the English department at the University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont. This evening, I'll be your host, introducing Harsha Walia, our fantastic speaker, and I will also help facilitate the Q&A portion of our talk. Tonight's event is hosted by the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series, which has brought speakers to the UVM campus and Burlington community to provide a continuing program of radical analyses of social, ecological, and political concerns. It is also sponsored by several fantastic organizations. These organizations are Haymarket Books, of course, thank you so much to them, United Academics, Vermont AFL-CIO, the Peace and Justice Center, the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Department at UVM, the English Department at UVM, UVM Students Union, the People's Revolutionary Party at the University of Vermont, Students for Decolonizing Palestine at the University of Vermont, the Revolutionary Students Union, Decolonize Burlington, UVM Mutual Aid, YDSA, Vermonters for Justice in Palestine, and the Society of Arab Students. This social justice lecture series is dedicated to Will Miller, Vermont's activist philosopher and UVM philosophy professor for 35 years. I personally did not have the privilege of knowing Will, but in many ways it feels like I did. Before I even had the utmost privilege of being on the board for the lecture series, long before I had really even fostered a relationship with many of the board members, I recall scrolling through Will's archival website, absorbing his radical opinions and resolutions for change. So thus, in many ways, it feels like coming full circle to host a fantastic thinker in honor of Will. It is no doubt that Will Miller was an amazing person, deeply loved, the type of person so loved and respected that his legacy reverberates in the communities and spaces he inhabited. Um, in my research about Will and trying to understand the massive scope of his impact, my favorite quotation about him came from fellow board member Fred Magdoff in his 2005 eulogy for Will. He says, Will Miller will be there on picket lines, at rallies for social and economic justice and at anti-war demonstrations. From Washington DC to New York, up to Montpelier and Burlington, wherever people fight for a better world, that's where you'll find Will Miller. Will's vision for social change range far and wide, so it's only appropriate the topics of the lecture series do too. Thus, I'm pleased to announce that today's topic, the abolition of borders, feeling brilliant, fe sorry, excuse me, featuring brilliant author Harsha Walia, based in Vancouver, Canada. Today, we will discuss global migration, racial capitalism, and the case for no borders. Harsha Walia is the author of Undoing Border Imperialism, co-author of Never Home, Legislating Discrimination and Canadian Immigration, as well as Red Woman Rising, Indigenous Women Survivors in Vancouver's Downtown East Side, and has contributed to over 30 academic journals. Her most recent work, Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism, was published in February 2021 by Haymarket Books and received critical acclaim. We are immensely lucky to have her here to give us a lecture on her work and ideas with an opportunity for dialogue near the end of the session. Before we continue, however, I would like to say that tonight's lecture is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Louis P. Lipset, Will's father-in-law and Anne's father who passed away only 19 days ago. He loved Will, helped come up with the idea for the series, and was a great supporter of our mission. He will be greatly missed. May he rest in peace. And with that, I'm so pleased to introduce Harsha Walia. Hi, Harsha. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for the warm welcome and the introduction, and thank you to all of the organizers. Um, and thank you for invoking that memory and biography. It's, uh, it's such an honor to be here uh, today. Um, and to be speaking with all of you and connecting with all of you, and I, I look forward to the conversation. Um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about today is to just start by um, situating where I am and to start the conversation by saying that I'm on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Coast Salish people. I'm on the lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations, the indigenous nations whose land uh, continues to be occupied by the, Cano the Canadian colonial state, um, but really for me to affirm that Indigenous laws and Indigenous jurisdiction continues to be alive on these lands. Um, and I think that's so vital um, in thinking about a politics of abolishing the border, a politics of no borders, because really one of the fundamental things that borders do is that they're, in, they're completely entangled in the violence of empire and settler colonialism which is to say that there really can't be a, a politics, a border abolition that doesn't recognize uh, the politics of land back and of indigenous sovereignty. Uh, because all around the world, one of the things that borders has done is to cleave indigenous nations um, and to establish colonial states. And that's really the, the modern history of borders uh, in that they're inextricable 
from empire. And so I really want to situate a politics of migrant justice and border abolition in the context of decolonial politics, of a politics of anti-empire and anti-imperialism. Um, and what I'm going to be focusing the talk on today is a, a couple of um, a couple of major points that I that I want to make in this conversation, uh, and really just some ideas around what I think a politics of no borders means. And when I start by doing that. Uh, by situating my talk in the context of this moment, this moment in the United States in particular, uh, and really the Joe Biden administration. Because, you know, as we know, there was a lot of celebratory clamor around uh, his presidency. Um, and this happens every time a Democratic president uh, comes back into power after the swing to the Republicans and the kind of praise that is heaped on them. But, you know, that kind of uh, praise and clamor was short-lived because we've seen the Biden administration every single day proceeding with deportations and ICE proceeding with deporting and detaining thousands of people consistently every day still to Guatemala, to Honduras, to Haiti, to Jamaica, right? There's the, the invocation of the migration crisis and the border crisis is in the news constantly still. And marking the start of Black History Month several months ago, Black Alliance for Just Immigration blasted Biden's refusals to, at that time, stop ICE. And they tweeted, quote, nothing about this administration's values and actions give us confidence that black people will be prioritized in the new national agenda. Continued detention and hasten deportations are a sounding alarm for what's to come, end quote. At the same time, organizers with, with Mi Gente, a grassroots organization made up of Latinx and Chicanx people, similarly said, quote, Joe Biden's current plan, a de facto return to the Obama years, would mean more desperation, more deportations, and more death, end quote. And I start with those two quotes because I think it's very critical um, in this moment to pay attention to what to expect from the Biden administration and to look back at previous administrations like the Obama years, like the Clinton years, because it's precisely under centrist neoliberal rule, like those of Biden, like those of Obama, like those of Clinton, that we have to be the most vigilant. Because while former President Donald Trump's overtly malicious policies of separating families, caging children, banning black and brown Muslims, and building the border wall garnered international condemnation, these cruel policies of immigration enforcement are actually a pillar also of democratic governance. This is part of the Democrats' record. And in particular, uh, the cornerstone of the Democrats' immigration platform, if you will, is precisely this rhetoric of quote unquote productive and legal immigrants while demonizing so-called criminal and illegal immigrants. That is the cornerstone of the party's platform for three decades. And that's why we have to be vigilant because it is a very specific insidious kind of divide and rule. And it was under presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama that an entire immigration enforcement apparatus that was bent on expanding detention and deportation, on criminalizing migration, on militarizing the border, and outsourcing of border enforcement was cemented, right? So Donald Trump didn't just implement the most malicious policies, he escalated an infrastructure that was already there. And that's really important to remember, um, because otherwise we fall into the trap of assuming uh, that things will change under the Biden administration without recognizing that this is actually the inheritance of the Democratic Party. So just to turn back slightly in time um, to the Clinton years and Obama years, just by way of an overview so that we can understand what to expect under the Biden administration. Um, and, you know, one thing that we should note about the Clinton years in the 90s is that it was actually under Bill Clinton that the most severe consequences of border militari militarization and mass detention took place in the United States. In fact, in 1994, as Clinton was signing the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is one of the world's largest free trade agreements that brings about incredible privatization um, outsourcing that brings, you know, really solidified um, the regime of private property and corporate ownership of land in Mexico and forced a number of changes to, um, to public infrastructure in Mexico, really decimated the public sector in Mexico, in Mexico, and really underwrote what we now know 
uh, as you know, structural adjustment, right? Which is the mass enforcement of poverty across the global South. So at the same time that Clinton was signing the North American Free Trade Agreement to ensure the kind of free movement of capital, if you will, the Army Corps of Engineers was fencing the, the US-Mexico border to constrict the movement of the very people displaced by NAFTA. And I think this is very important to remember because a lot of times when the elites, the political elite tell us that privatization, that policies of austerity, um, that policies of neoliberalism will actually trickle up, one of the ways in which we know that that is not true is that we can point to this moment in 1994 because in 1994, as NAFTA was being signed, the political elite knew it would lead to mass impoverishment and mass displacement to such a degree that the border would need to be militarized, right? So they foresaw that there would be mass displacement as a result of NAFTA, that it wouldn't in fact trickle down, that it would in fact wealth would trickle up, right? Which is what capitalism is. Capitalism is an economic and political system of trickle up wealth. And so in this moment, as NAFTA was being signed, it was under Clinton um, that the first kind of what we now know as the first iterations of intense border militarization began. And Border Patrol in the 90s tripled in size to become the second largest enforcement agency at the time. And there was a number of border militarization operations, such as Hold the Line in Texas, Gatekeeper in California, Safeguard in Arizona, all of which militarized the border under the official strategy of what's known as, quote, prevention through deterrence. And prevention through deterrence is a very slick bureaucratic way of saying that we actually want, expect, and will implement policies in order to ensure that migrants and refugees and undocumented people on the move will die will die, right? Prevention through deterrence means we will prevent migration by deterring people from migrating, by making conditions so dangerous such that people will die. So prevention through deterrence is a border killing strategy. And within six years of funneling migration through more dangerous routes like the Sonoran Desert, the Arizona uplands and the Southern Texas brush, this is exactly what happened. Border deaths increased by 509% in the United States. And now estimates are that anywhere from 8,000 to over 10,000 people have died at the border. And, you know, these kinds of stories that we have become desensitized to, that have become normalized about border deaths, about people dying at the border, people being dehydrated, people being found. Um, we have to remember that there is actually nothing normal about a border death. This is an active policy choice, the policy choice of prevention through deterrence. And that's why I think it's much more accurate to speak of border deaths as border killings, right? We have to name them as border killings because border death is a very passive way of speaking about state violence. These are border killings. Um, and in fact, it's necessary also because oftentimes when we, when we listen to mainstream media stories about border deaths, we're faced with, you know, mainstream uh, news stories and headlines that really victim blame, right? In the same way that rape culture is all about victim blaming, all about placing responsibility on survivors, um, of victim blaming in terms of, you know, what were they wearing or why were they out? You know, those kinds of narratives. We hear similar kinds of narratives invoked um, in order to justify border deaths as something that migrants are responsible for, right? Like why were they on this dangerous journey? Why did they get on a leaky boat? Why did they travel with their child? All of these are fundamentally victim blaming narratives, again, akin to rape culture, right? Except this is really how normalized border killings have become, that we don't even name them as border killings, we name them as a passive border deaths, and that we place responsibility for the death on the person themselves rather, on, rather than on the state that has created the conditions of precarity and violence and fatality. So it's so important, and I'll, I'll come back to language shortly, because I think language is so important in how we understand the border. And that's just one example. So after the, the Clinton years, it was, and you know, there's so much more uh, that we could say about the Clinton years, and maybe the one other thing that I'll say uh, 
is that in addition to normalizing border militarization, it really was under the Clinton years where we saw the explosion of the prison industrial complex. And at the same time, not coincidentally, we saw the explosion of the number of migrants and immigrants who were detained for so-called criminality, right? So it became harder and harder to remain in the U.S. and easier and easier to be deported um, if you had you know, certain felony charges, if you had certain criminal records. So here we start to see uh, the conflation between so-called criminality and so-called illegality. And this continues to be perpetuated in the Obama years. So Obama turbocharged the Secure Communities Initiative, which until 2014 meant that over 1,000 local law enforcement jurisdictions were linked to ICE and FBI databases. And this nearly doubled deportation rates. And by 2014, about half of all federal criminal arrests were immigration related. I'm going to say that again. About half of all federal criminal arrests were immigration related. Again, you see the nexus and the confluence between police, prisons, and the immigration enforcement system, right? How they all operate as pipelines to each other. And that same year, in 2014, people may remember, was the surge of unaccompanied minors at the border. And it was in that year that President Obama laid the foundation for incarcerating migrant families by detaining them in camps on military bases, which then escalated to hundreds and hundreds of missing children under Donald Trump and forced family separation, right? So again, Trump didn't start the policy of detaining migrant families. It was actually under Obama, but was escalated under Donald Trump. And in fact, several of the photographs of children in cages that went viral during Trump's presidency were actually taken during the Obama years. And Obama earned the moniker of deporter in chief for overseeing over three million deportations, which he accomplished by weaponizing good immigrants against so-called bad immigrants. Again, like Clinton, his administration prioritized deport deporting non-citizens with criminal records. And in fact, before he launched DACA, the DACA protections, again, highly praised, highly lauded, Obama actually signaled his intention to increase enforcement against so-called undesirable immigrants by saying, quote, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide hard for her kids, end quote. So again, we see the ways in which um, President Obama, very similar to President Clinton, really relied on this rhetoric of good versus bad immigrant, right? Where again, the so-called bad immigrant is the person with a criminal record, um, is, you know, are much more likely, those who are much more likely to be tagged and targeted as undesirable are folks who are black immigrants and migrants. And Baji has done a ton of work on this in terms of the disproportionate rate of deportation for black migrants and refugees and asylum seekers and undocumented people. Um, also, you know, uh, those who are not proximate to whiteness, those who are accessing social assistance and are not seen as quote unquote contributing in the wage economy, right? So the divisions between good and bad really reinforce all of the hierarchies and forms of oppression that already exist in our society. And of course, President Obama, as he was deporting over 3 million people, was also the commander in chief who was responsible for bombing, for more bombs um, and for more drone warfare than any other US president uh, in American history, right? Um, so the number of bombs and drones that were dropped simultaneously to the number of people who were deemed deported was a continuous loop of violence. And this is precisely why it is so necessary to reject the division between good versus bad immigrants, right? Is to, because to do so is to fall into the state's trap, is to fall into precisely the Democratic Party's narrative of so-called productive and legal immigrant versus so-called criminal and illegal immigrant. Um, and, you know, as black abolitionists like Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Mariam Kaba would remind us, innocence is a limiting political stance, right? We don't want to focus on the innocence or the, um, the dehumanization of people whom we are supporting and defending. Because innocence is a limiting political stance because criminality and illegality are both political constructions constantly shifting, which is why it's so important that we stand for principles like no human being is illegal, principles like not one more deportation, not one more detention, that reject the violence of the state, right? That turn the gaze away from immigrants and refugees constantly having to perform desirability and having to perform innocence 
to actually rejecting state violence. I want to move now to talk about language. As I mentioned, I wanted to touch on on on, on um, language and the importance of language. And you know, one of the examples I gave was how important it is to shift, for example, from border death to border killings. And similarly, I think it's important to reframe the migration crisis for a number of reasons, right? So when we think of the migration crisis or the border crisis or, you know, migrant caravans, all of this kind of language is not accurate because if we think about the global migration crisis, it's actually more accurately, I would argue, describe, be described as a crisis of displacement and immobility. And the emphasis here on displacement forces us to interrogate the root causes of conquest, capitalism, and climate change that are the real culprits and drivers of displacement. And further, when we say migration crisis, we tend to assume that most people are actually able to move in the search for safety, when in fact, most people around the world are immobilized. Despite constant border panics blasted by Western media, 95% of forcibly displaced people remain internally displaced or in refugee camps in neighboring countries. Researchers note that less than 1% of refugees living in camps around the world find a permanent home in a different country. And most people are not able to move because border controls are deadly. Border controls are deadly. People are being contained at border sites and refugee camps through interdiction, through pushbacks, through restricted visa requirements, smart borders, walls, you know, just whole infrastructure of violence makes it impossible for people to actually be on the move. So reframing the migration crisis as a displacement and immobility crisis illuminates the fact that most migrants are both forcibly displaced and then systematically immobilized. So displacement and immobility then, not free movement, is the reality of racial imperial management in our contemporary era. In this sense, borders are carceral regimes, right? Police, prisons, and borders all operate by immobilizing people who are caught in their crosshairs. Notably, the word mob, right, the word mob, a criminalizing vocabulary used to link large groups of poor racialized people to social disorder, whether it's in the inner cities or at the border, derives from the word mobility. And in this way, I think it's really interesting to think about how mobility is precisely what is being criminalized when we're thinking about carceral regimes. Angela Davis and Gina Dent in the early 2000s wrote a, a piece about prisons. And in that they wrote, quote, we continue to find that the prison is itself a border, end quote. And I think drawing on Davis and Dent, we can say that if the prison is a border, then the border is a prison. The border is at once domestic and global, and a world without police, prisons, private property, militaries, and borders is a necessarily interconnected abolitionist horizon of freedom. The second reason that I think language is important is because language such as migrant crisis or refugee crisis or border crisis is a pretext to shore up further border securitization and repressive practices. We know that whenever language like crisis is used, instead of actually supporting or turning our gaze towards those who are impacted by said crisis, it's actually the state who benefits, right? Responses to so-called crises end up in service to the state and reconfigurations of state power. And that's what happens. Images and language of crisis, border crisis, swarms, invaders, floods, caravans, all of that kind of language essentially depicts and villainizes migrants and refugees as the cause of a border crisis. Um, and that is, again, why it's so important to reject that language of a crisis, because it ends up in the service of the state. Perhaps most ironically and offensively, the migration crisis is declared a new crisis with predominantly Western countries positioned as its victims, even though for four centuries, nearly 80 million Europeans became settler colonists across the Americas and Oceania, while four million indentured laborers from Asia were scattered across the globe and the transatlantic slave trade kidnapped and enslaved 15 million Africans. Colonialism, genocide, slavery, and indentureship are not only commonly erased, completely erased, as continuities of violence in current invocations of the so-called migration crisis, but they are the very conditions of possibility for Western notions of border sovereignty, right? So we can't think about or talk about migration, if you will, um, without talking about these continuities of violence and how migration, migration, 
is again forms of displacement and immobility that are completely underwritten and entangled with these ongoing, ongoing forms of violence. And the last thing I want to say about language um, is that, you know, again, this may seem like semantics, but I think it's important in how we start to question um, the border is that who is even considered a migrant within the narrative of the so-called migration crisis really tells us that it actually has nothing to do with law and order or policies, but really has everything to do with racial class power. Because we never talk about business travelers, expats, diplomats, vacationers, investors as migrants, right? Even though there are millions of people on the move today, including people columbusing, and I use that verb deliberately, right? People who are columbusing all around the world on luxury yachts, people hopping on airplanes in first class every week, people with investor class visas, that kind of movement is not surveillance, scapegoated, scrutinized, or problematic. In fact, under our system of, col of colonialism and capitalism, that kind of, of movement, right? That kind of movement that is a refraction of settler colonialism, that is a refraction of empire, that represents the dominant race, class, caste, settler status, etc., is actually celebrated and sought after. I mean, gentrifiers are the new colonial pioneers, right? Usurping land and property and building gated communities enforced through policing and displacement of homeless encampments, very similar. And so when we're saying migration crisis, again, in popular vernacular, we aren't actually talking about all kinds of movement or anyone on the move. In fact, embedded in the language of migration crisis, is the anti-Black idea of a certain kind of inherently undesirable movement, the unregulated, ungovernable movement of predominantly racialized, poor, and oppressed people. Again, here coming back to the word mob. So contemporary immigration enforcement in this way draws heavily from this foundational terror of anti-Black violence, particularly the regulation of Black movement. And Ronaldo Walcott and Idil Abdullahi write that, quote, Movements that we now call migration are founded in anti-blackness, taking their logic from transatlantic slavery, end quote. So again, when the state and mainstream media invoke a migration crisis, it's not all movement or all people crossing borders they have in mind, but specifically displaced and immobilized people on the other side of whiteness, on the other side of capital, on the other side of empire, who are being dehumanized, who are being contained, who are being surveillanced and captured by carceral system of borders. I want to now move to um, thinking briefly about uh, the border, particularly the U.S.-Mexico southern border, um, in the context of racial violence. And this, I think, is particularly important because a lot of times, um, particularly in North America, indigenous decolonial and black abolition struggles are often seen as disconnected from the immigrant rights movement, except in identifying shared struggle against racism. However, the war on migrants does not exist separate from or simpler, simply parallel to anti-Indigenous and anti-Black violence. In order for the border to be anti-migrant, in order for the border to exclude, it is also necessarily anti-Indigenous and anti-Black. And we see this in a number of ways. We see this, of course, in the disproportionate targeting of Indigenous and Black migrants and refugees who are overwhelmingly people who are on the move people who are displaced, who are impacted by capitalism and conquest. And we also see this in the historic formation of the border, right? So the formation of the U.S.-Mexico border is bound up in the capture of territory. So we know that the U.S.-Mexico border, for example, um, actually captured over 525,000 square miles of territory from Mexico with the imposition of the Treaty of, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, right, the forced annexation of Mexican territory. And so in this way, the creation of the border is completely bound up in empire. And when we talk about immigration politics, you know, the liberal narrative of nation of immigrants um, often erases the violence of conquest, right? The violence of conquest. We're not a nation of immigrants. This is a nation founded in settler colonialism, empire, and enslavement, both Canada and the United States. And so it's really important to think about how the border is bound up in anti-Black and anti-Indigenous violence and in imperialist expansion through its very formation. Um, I also want to note uh, a really important history around that same time 
So shortly after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the forced annexation of territory that was captured and became so-called U.S. territory, a few years after that, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850. And this act allowed slaveholders to kidnap and capture black people they claimed had escaped. After the 1848 annexation, slave owners formed militias to patrol the U.S.-Mexico border to prevent black people from escaping to Mexico. Some of the earliest bordering practices at the U.S.-Mexico border were not only to keep migrants out, but were also to, con to control enslaved black people and keep them in. And so this is really important, right? Because we see the ways in which anti-migrant exclusion is both about exclusion, but also control. Um, and in this way, again, completely bound up in anti-indigenous violence, the expansion of settler colonialism and processes of enslavement. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, I think I have about 10 more minutes, um, is the connection to imperialism. So a lot of times immigration politics um, becomes domesticated, right? Which is that we think about immigration in these very domesticated frameworks of, uh, you know, how many immigrants can we accept? Um, and a lot of white anxieties about the border and liberal centrist responses focus on kind of charity or humanitarianism, or again, kind of comments like we're all immigrants or we need immigrants. And what this ignores is the foundational violence of what creates migration. So migrations uh, into the U.S., for example, from Mexico and Central America are often presented as from over there or not our problem. When in fact, the kinds of displacements that we're talking about are inextricable from U.S. violence, right? Whether it's created by U.S. dirty wars backing death squads or the counterinsurgency terror of the war on terror, or capitalist trade agreements like NAFTA that I mentioned earlier. So the U.S. border crisis is more accurately described as a crisis of displacement that is generated by U.S. policies, right? And that's why a really powerful slogan is we are here because you are there, right? We are here because you are there, which is um, a way to connect the violences of, of, of migration. And we know that imperialism, conquest, capitalism, climate change, global inequities are a root cause of global migration. The total number of migrants worldwide has reached 272 million people, 3.5% of the world's entire population. Palestinians, for example, are considered the world's most protracted refugee population, with 5.5 to 6 million Palestinians in refugee camps. This can be traced back, of course, to 1948, with the creation of the apartheid state of Israel and when heavily armed Zionist paramilitaries conquered Palestinian territories. Climate change is now also one of the fastest growing forms of displacement, again, intertwined with the violence of military occupation, of land theft, of resource extraction, of trade agreements, of labor exploitation. And in 2016, new displacements caused by climate disasters outnumbered new displacements as a result of persecution by a ratio of three to one which is basically to say that, you know, as we know, the climate, that climate change and climate catastrophe is impending disaster, particularly for coastal communities, rural community, peasant communities. By 2015, one estimate suggests that 143 million people will be displaced in just three regions. As the late great Stuart Hall once put it, quote, migration is increasingly the joker in the globalization pact, end quote. So we can understand migration as both an act of individual self-determination, but also as a collective expression of decolonial reparations and redistribution long overdue. The other point that I want to make about imperialism is that imperialism is not just the cause of global migration. We know that it is, right? Imperialism is one of the drivers of global displacement, forced impoverishment following Walter Rodney and Edward Said and others. Um, but also that increasingly the management of global migration and the outsourcing of border controls is also becoming a means of preserving imperial relations. And I think this is incredibly important because there's live debates amongst the left right now about whether imperialism is still a useful mode of political analysis. And if we are to look at um, the ways in which borders are being outsourced, if we followed that thread, 
then it would be undeniable. It would be undeniable the ways in which imperialism continues to be a way in which we need to understand the world. U.S., Australian, and European subordination of Central America, of Oceania, of Africa, and the Middle East compels countries in these global South regions to accept border checkpoints, to accept the outsourcing of border violence, to accept offshore detention as conditions of trade and aid agreements. So this is to say that countries in the global south, including countries like Libya, Mali, Mexico, Nairu, Niger, Papua New Guinea, Turkey, and Sudan, these are the countries that are actually the new frontiers of border militarization. It is not necessarily, you know, the United States. It is not necessarily Canada. It's not even Europe. It is actually countries in the global south who are being forced to accept various degrees of force and coercion are being forced to accept new technologies of border militarization. In the United States, Customs and Border Protection has trained 15,000 border agents from 100 different countries. Todd Miller remarks, quote, close your eyes and point to any land mass on a world map, and your finger will probably find a country that is building up its borders in some way with Washington's assistance, end quote. And all of the horrors that were unfolding under Trump's Remain in Mexico protocols and now continuing under President Biden is a result of precisely this kind of border outsourcing. The U.S. funds immigration enforcement in Mexico and El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras, all to stop migrants and refugees well before they even reach the U.S.-Mexico border. And this is important because, you know, when President Biden says, I'm no longer building the border wall. And again, you know, there's a lot of celebration around that, that he gets a lot of praise. Um, we need to understand that him not building the border wall doesn't mean anything when he's actually outsourcing that border wall, outsourcing that border enforcement to other countries. And this was, you know, going back to precedent, this method of outsourcing the border was really perfected under President Obama. Um, and it was under President Obama that the border started to get outsourced into Mexico, into Guatemala, into El Salvador, into Mexico. And the U.S. funds an entire network of border enforcement in Mexico and Central America. And it was actually the U.S. US Homeland Security officials once declared that, quote, the Guatemalan border with Chiapas is now our southern border. The Guatemalan border with Chiapas is now our southern border, which again confirms this new kind of frontier of border militarization. And this is not unique or specific to the United States. I won't go into examples now, but you know, Europe, um, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, all of these kinds, of, all of these countries have outsourced the border in the same way. And this is important because we can take from it two things. First, that borders are not fixed lines simply demarcating territory, right? So when we think about the violence of borders in the U.S. context, we cannot just think about what's happening at the site of the, of the border, right? We can't just think about the border wall. We need to be thinking about all the ways in which the border and its violence is being outsourced or insourced. Borders are productive regimes firmly embedded in global imperialism. And border controls now exist far beyond the territorial border itself. So I think we need to be paying much more attention to how the outsourcing of border controls is increasingly a method of maintaining imperial superpowers in the world, especially for U.S., Canada, Israel, India, Australia, New Zealand, U.K., and Western and Central EU countries. Second, we have to understand how critical immigration-related diplomacy is to current global relations. Immigration diplomacy through the soft power of aid agreements, or in some cases, outright threats of trade war, compels countries across Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and Oceania to accept outsourced migration controls, all of which cements imperial relations, maintains our colonial present, and globalizes the violence of borders. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is the centrality of borders to racial capitalism. So really quickly, for those who are unfamiliar, the framing of racial capitalism that I'm drawing on is rooted in the works of Cedric Robinson, Neville Alexander, Robin D.G. Kelly, Angela Davis, and the larger Black Marxist tradition. Cedric Robinson theorized the linkage between racial expropriation and capitalism as racial capitalism, which is to say 
that the social construction and the real differentiation of race is not a secondary outcome of capitalism, but rather that racism is constitutive of capitalism. So what is crucial here to understand is that capitalism relies on, requires, and reproduces racial hierarchies. In that sense, there can be no anti-capitalism that is not also anti-racist, and there can be no anti-racism that is not also anti-capitalist. So racism is a material structure that is foundational to labor exploitation, to conquest, to territorial expansion, to dispossession, to enslavement, to corporate ownership, to surveillance, to the border, and really to the entire maintenance of the so-called global south vis-a-vis -vis the global north. And here, the global reliance increasingly on migrant workers demonstrates the centrality of the border to racial capitalism. In the case of migrant workers, I'm here I'm not talking about undocumented workers, but I'm talking about migrant workers, those who are uh, state-sanctioned migrant workers. For example, in the United States, the H2, H2A, H HB visas. In the case of migrant workers, their distinct ordering as a legal but deportable pool of labor generates structural hierarchies between racialized migrant workers and so-called citizen workers, right, which further affixes race to citizenship. This is not just a question of bad employers exploiting their employees, though of course there are many bad employers, but this is of the border and bordering regimes that facilitates the segmentation of certain workers as migrant workers. There is an entire class of workers who, even though they are our neighbors and in the same workforce as us, are suddenly in a different position with completely different rights, completely different entitlements and deportable. And this happens because of the border, right? Migration is controlled by borders in order to create an imperial racial regime of terror, as we've talked about earlier, but also to produce pliable labor segmented by nationality and race. The border acts as a spatial fix for capitalism and is a key pillar of racialized capitalism and racist citizenship. Capitalism requires labor to be constantly segmented and differentiated, whether across race, gender, ability, class, sexuality, and now also citizenship. These stratifications cheapen labor because we know there is no such thing as cheap labor, right? It is the conditions of capitalism that creates manufactured vulnerability. And lack of full and permanent immigration status is key to creating pools of hyper-exploitable cheapened labor. So migrant workers face not only the threat of termination, but also the threat of deportation. So in this way, Termination and deportation work in tandem as a union vesting mechanism, right? To cheapen their labor power, to cheapen their political power. And really, I would argue migrant workers is a euphemism for third world workers. Jobs like farm work, domestic work, service work that cannot be outsourced, right? Like manufacturing is increasingly outsourced. The kind of work that can't be outsourced is now being insourced. And in this way, insourcing and outsourcing represent two sides of the same capitalist coin, deliberately deflated labor and political power. So the state has not withered away under capitalism. And this is important because a lot of leftists will argue that the state has withered away under neoliberal, neoliberal globalization. And while it is true that austerity has meant a weakened public sector, the financial and carceral systems of the state that guarantee capital flows, that guarantee social control, these systems have expanded. And borders are one of them. Borders are not intended to exclude all people or to deport all people, but to create conditions of deportability, right? And this is crucial. It's not to deport all people. It's to create conditions of deportability, which in turn increases precarity. And it is so necessary to understand how important migrant workers are to racial capitalism because it shows us that the border actually works in the interests of capital and not against it. Migrant workers don't suppress wages. Many major unions would have us believe that migrant workers are basically scab workers. They're not. Bosses and borders, right? Those are the real enemies. Free capital requires immobilized labor that the border produces. And so it's so important for left movements to take up the call for status for all workers. This means that all migrant workers should have immigration status, the right to collectively organize and unionize, and full rights to labor protections and full rights to health and safety protections. The only way to fight back against the cheapening of labor and the lowering, uh, the lowering of the wage floor
is to engage in an internationalist fight against racist citizenship and racial capitalism, which is to say for immigration status and for labor protections and living wages for all workers, such that the border becomes obsolete. I want to close by um, offering a quote by Eduardo Galeano. Eduardo Galeano, in an interview, once said, the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be the home for everyone. And I think that's really what it means to think about abolishing the border, right? It means that we reject the shallow liberal politics of humanitarianism, such as welcome refugees, or the shallow politics of liberal multiculturalism that says we're all for some, from somewhere, or from the kind of commodifying platitudes such as immigrants build our economies. We need to refuse that kind of liberal center. What we need is a vigorous internationalist politics, one that refuses categories of desirable or undesirable, one that refuses gestures of humanitarianism, one that refuses the trope of grateful refugees migrating to modernity, one that refuses the commodification of immigrant labor to benefit capital accumulation, one that refuses carceral regimes as, le as legitimate institutions of governance. Instead, we must make clear not one more detention, not one more detention, not one more deportation and immigration status and labor protections for all. We must also go further and reject the normalization of the border that casts racialized people as perpetual outsiders, that erases indigenous nations, that reproduces an anti-black racial order, that fortifies the West against the rest, that deflates labor power and is the ideological basis for all immigration policies. We have to be clear that the borders of settler states are illegal, but human beings are never illegal. We also need to think of a no border politics as expansive, which is that it is not just about opening up the border, but it is actually about thinking about dismantling all bordering systems, all order systems, and all exploitative regimes. We have to dismantle all the systems that uphold a system of apartheid that even allows the global north to exist in relationship to the global south or the conditions of the south within the north. We have to eradicate the asymmetrical reality of who is displaced and who is forced to move and under what conditions. We need to fundamentally change this world, right? A no border politics means no one is forcibly displaced and that people are free to move, that those are not contradictions, but necessary corollaries. That means saying no to military occupations, no more drone warfare, no more prisons, no more police, no more sweatshops, no more corporations, no more banks, and no more borders. This is all part of the revolutionary horizon that we need. So in this way, a no border politics is expansive. It includes the freedom to stay and the freedom to move. The crux of a no border politics then is again nestled, nestled in the broader politics of home, as, as Eduardo Galeano would remind us. How do we create a world where we all have a home, where we can all claim home, where we are all at home in our bodies, where the earth is cared for as a home? And thinking of home is not a sentimental matter, right? At the edge of climate catastrophe and all the forms of violence all around us every day, on the edge of vaccine apartheid, it really is a pressing political issue. And I want to um, really emphasize that, right? That we really have to be thinking about this as, as a transformative visionary politics. And that political struggle is really what's, what's gonna get us there. Um, and I wanna close again with the words of Eduardo Galeano, which is that the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. Thank you so much. Harsha, thank you so much. Um, you have such a talent of being concise and thoughtful comprehensive and scalding all at once. It's such a treat. I think I speak for everyone when I say it's such a treat to listen to you speak. Um, we have a couple questions, some live questions in the chat, if you would uh, like to answer some of them. The first one that we have is from Helen, Dr. Helen Scott. Um, and she's, she's asking, border and rule describes racist nationalism as a ruling class ideology that breaks international solidarity and lowers the wage floor for all workers. Could you elaborate on this dynamic? So you cut out for a sec. Do you mind repeating that as a I just heard bordering rule explains and then it cut out. Absolutely. Um, the question is border and rule describes racist nationalism as a ruling class ideology that breaks international solidarity and lowers the wage floor for all workers. Would you elaborate on this dynamic? Sure. 
Yeah. So when I um, I'm thinking of, you know, racist nationalism, particularly as it relates to um, immigration and the border, we can think of racist nationalism and its politics uh, as really unfolding in a number of ways. Right. One is, of course, the really overt racist white supremacy and the escalation of white nationalism. Um, and that's that kind of racist nationalism is perhaps more obvious in terms of, um, you know, how it's harmful and violent and, and hurtful. Um, but there's other kinds of racist nationalisms that I think, again, align more with, you know, liberal centrist responses, right? And I think one of the, one example I can give is um, the example that, uh, oh, sorry, just saw this chat's confusing me, um, is the example of uh, American jobs for American workers only. Um, or in the Canadian context, it takes the form of Canadian jobs for Canadian workers only. And that's often a response to neoliberal globalization, right? So neoliberal globalization uh, is seen, of course, rightfully so, as um, creating privatization, manufacturing, being outsourced, job losses, right? And so often a response to that is a kind of um, response to suggest um, that American jobs are for American workers only. So that kind of nationalism isn't always seen as racist, but I would argue that it is. It's a kind of racist nationalism. Um, also in an era of austerity, another example is one that scapegoats migrants. And so we'll often hear the refrain of, we have to help our own before we help others. And in this case, you know, you have the elite suddenly claiming to care about homelessness, houselessness, you know, the public sector, lack of childcare, lack of healthcare, lack of um, public education um, by scapegoating migrants, right? So they'll say, we have to care about our own before we care about others. So these are the kind of perhaps more insidious forms of racist nationalism. And I think the ways in which they break international solidarity is that, of course, they suggest, they circumscribe uh, the working class by invoking the idea of citizenship, right? So American jobs for American workers only suggest that workers in other parts of the world are not of concern to the American working class. And in fact, pits, again, you know, migrant workers or so-called third world workers against so-called citizen workers by suggesting that their interests are not aligned. Um, and so that breaks international solidarity and the border works to do that, right? The border works to fracture the international working class, if you will, um, by really segmenting those divisions, by not only creating divisions, but actively pitting people against each other. And here, one of the really fundamental assumptions is that migrants um, are, uh, you know, migrants are competing against uh, so-called American workers. And in this formulation, it, it's, it assumes that migrants are not also workers, right? As if the migrants are not really the spear of class struggle, because we know that racialized migrant women in particular are the lowest paid, most devalued, most precarious workers. So rather than seeing, um, seeing our interests as aligned, there tends to be a scope, a scapegoating kind of effect. And often in some cases, you know, where unions will call, major major unions will call for greater enforcement against migrant workers. So there's often, there's been this trend for the past 20, 30 years where many unions will take the position of cracking down um, on, you know, recruiters, traffickers um, in, in, the, in the labor force, which really is calling for more border enforcement, right? So we really need to be thinking about that. And here I think a really apt analogy is, uh, you know, the, the, the ways in which we see that calls to crack down on sex work and call for, calls for the criminalization of sex work are violent and harmful, right? In the same way, calls to crack down on migrant workers are a same kind of criminalizing logic. Um, and the ways in which they really uh, lower the wage floor is because the only way in which we will lift the wage floor for, for all workers is literally by doing it for all workers, right? I think there's a flawed logic where, again, there's an assumption um, that migrant workers are scab workers who are responsible for lowering the wage floor because they, quote unquote, work for less. But of course, they're not working for less. That's the condition of deportability. That is the state-sanctioned kind of exploitative visa regime that allows for them to be exempt 
from minimum wage that allows them to be exempt from labor protections, for example. And so in this way, I think it's so important to understand because insourcing and outsourcing are flip sides of the same coin, um, capital works by segmenting labor, right? Um, if we refuse that segmentation, that is the only way in which we will actually lift the wage floor for all workers by not allowing the border to do the work that it is intended to do, right? Which is to create that segmentation of labor, but rather to see ourselves in a joint internationalist struggle. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Curtis Brown, who would like to know, what do you see as the distinct ways the crisis of displacement and immobility has been compounded by the pandemic? Do such developments underscore or alter any specific insights of border and rule? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things um, that happened in the pandemic that I think really highlighted the crisis of, of immobility is that, you know, despite there being no directive to do so, um, we saw many states, uh, over 60 at different times, really close their border to quote unquote irregular movement in particular, right? So the United States, for example, closed its border and um, really expedited expulsions at the border, particularly for irregular movement. But again, that contradiction or seeming contradiction, but really I would argue it's not a contradiction, it's, it's a necessary function of the border, is that at the same time, deportation flights were going out, right? So while certain movement was curtailed under the context of the, of the pandemic, um, deportation flights going out, expelling deportees, detaining and expelling deportees continued, right? And at one point early on um, in the pandemic, it was estimated that about anywhere from one third to one fifth of confirmed COVID cases in Guatemala and in Honduras actually came from deportation flights from the United States. And at the same time, while deportation flights were expelling people out, at the same time, one of the only kinds of visas that were being processed during the pandemic were unsurprisingly of migrant farm workers, right? Because the food supply chain had to be maintained. So suddenly COVID was not an issue. Migrant workers uh, were being brought in, were being forced to, you know, were living in, um, in the farms and fields of their employers under incredibly cramped conditions, completely unsafe COVID conditions. Um, in many cases, uh, you know, not even having to be tested, not being given any of the necessary equipment they needed to work. And so in that way, I think what the pandemic did is that it really highlighted what the function of the border is, right? Again, ensuring the free movement of capital and those who are those who secure capital interests while continuing to criminalize those whose migrant is deemed undesirable. Um, I think the other thing that the pandemic, I hope, highlighted uh, when it comes to, to movement and the politics of migration is that in order to keep any single one of us safe, we have to keep everyone safe, right? We understand our fundamental interconnectivity. Uh, and in that way, you know, even the fact that we can't be safe from COVID when the vast majority of the world is subjected to vaccine apartheid and is unvaccinated, while countries in the global north are not only vaccinated, but are now getting booster shots, right? The complete indignity and, unjust and the injustice of that. Um, and so I, I hope one thing that we start to realize is that we are bound up in all forms of violence, right? That we cannot keep ourselves safe unless we keep all of us safe. And in that way, I hope uh, a politics of no borders starts to, and I think we see this, we see abolitionist politics in general and decolonial politics and anti-imperialist politics um, really at the forefront of our social movements now. And I hope that that is one of the things that we start to realize in the pandemic, right? That we can't live in gated communities. We're not meant to live in isolation, but that really that liberation is a collective internationalist project. Thank you so much for such an excellent answer to an excellent question. So thank you for the question, Curtis. Our next question is from Ashley. And Ashley would like to know, um, Palestine is one of the key migrant justice struggles today. How does it fit into your overall analysis of border and rule? And what should we do in support of the Palestinian struggle for liber liberation? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's why it's it's so critical um, for migrant justice organizing to always have an anti-imperialist lens, right? Which is like to think about what are the causes of migration. And in that way, um, the right to stay, the right to move and the right to return are key pillars of that kind of work. And absolutely, I think, you know, the ways in which migrant justice movements think through um, what's happening in Palestine is to be firmly anti-occupation, to be firmly anti-apartheid, to firmly support Palestinian liberation. Because uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, you know, Palestinians are considered the most protracted refugee population. And that's like UN logic, right? And so if the UN says that, what, what are, what are the root causes for why Palestinians are the most protracted refugee population in their in their in their jargon. It's because Palestinians are still fighting for liberation against a settler colonial regime. Um, so absolutely, I think the struggle for migrant justice is absolutely um, alongside the struggle for Palestinian liberation, for liberation of Kashmir, for liberation of you know Kurdistan, just so many places that continue to be fighting for self determination. Um, and also, I think it's not a coincidence that the settler state. And the settler colonial state of Israel is vehemently anti-migrant. You know, the treatment particularly of African and Asian um, migrant workers and refugee in Israel are horrific, including conditions of sterilization that African women have been subjected to, right, that are heavily reported on. And so, again, we see that these are connected systems, right, that occupiers are also anti-migrant because that violence that kind of vi that foundational violence travels um, and that racial violence travels. And so I think, you know, that is also part of the struggle is to fight alongside um, to fight the Israeli state and the Israeli regime, both alongside Palestinian liberation for the right of the right to return for all Palestinian refugees and also alongside African and Asian migrants, refugees and migrant workers who are detained and exploited by the Israeli state. Thank you so much. Now we have another one from Mike. This is actually paraphrased from my colleague Isaac. Um, it seems like the prevention through deterrence policies, the state policies that kill migrants to deter further migration are similar to the work or die social conditions under capitalism. Do you see that connection too? Do you see a similar phenomenon elsewhere in society? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a, such a good connection. Um, and you know, those are exactly the parallels, right? It's like you can, you basically, um, create the conditions of death. You normalize and sanitize the death and that's the nature of, also the bureaucracy, right? Death by a thousand cuts. Um, and I, I do see that in, in many other ways. You know, I see it in the regulation of uh, homelessness and houselessness, right? So on the one hand, the state and capitalism creates the conditions, the, the conditions of poverty. Poverty is not natural. It's, a, it's an enforced state. It's a policy decision. And then also the policing of poverty, right? The policing of poverty perpetuates and criminalizes poverty as a social condition. Um, and so absolutely, I, you know, we can see those connections of criminalization. Um, gentrification works very much in the same way as well, both to displace uh, and then to criminalize. That's, you know, in, in that sense, I think carceral regimes have a very similar logic, which is to create social death. Um, and to create premature death. And, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore um, very aptly and, and brilliantly talks about racism in particular, structural racism, as the conditions of premature and premeditated death, right? And so we need to be thinking about that um, as a function of racial capitalism in particular. Thank you so much. We have one more. So. If you have any questions, everybody, you should get them in now while we still have Harsha. Um, our final question for the moment is, several years ago, the slogan abolish ICE was popularized with the immigrant rights protests that, explo that exploded as a response to Trump's family separation policy. It seems like much of the mainstream left has moved away from this forceful demand in recent years, with Sanders mem memorably calling open borders a Koch brothers dream. Can you comment on how the debate around ICE abolition and open borders has developed over the last few years on the left and where we go from here? Yeah, I think um, the demand to abolish ICE, uh, I hope is, you know, is getting reinvigorated in the context particularly of abolitionist movements and the resurgence of abolitionist movements. Of course, abolitionist movements didn't go anywhere, but 
um, the ways in which we're continuing to understand abolition, um, especially as it's rooted in, in Black-led movements against policing, prisons, and, and, and uh, all carceral systems. Um, but also, you know, abolish ICE, as many pointed out, was a very clear and important demand, um, but existed alongside other demands as well, right? To abolish ICE is also to abolish the border, is also to abolish DHS. Like, there's an entire infrastructure of control of which ICE is just one part. Um, but I do think the piece about Sanders is an important one um, because absolutely, I think, you know, and I only got, got to touch on this a little bit, but I think those leftists who suggest that open borders is actually um, a capitalist vision are fundamentally incorrect. Because again, even though we know that the borders are open to capital, they function by immobilizing labor, right? So the idea that many leftists assume, which is like, okay, well, if we just open up the border, then globalized capitalism um, will just mean, you know, free capital flows, is to, like, it's a misrepresentation because, first of all, that is the nature of capitalism, right? Like, capitalism is the free flow of capital. It's not the free flow that is the problem. It is the capital that is the problem, right? And capitalism requires immobilized labor and the border works in the interests of capital. It does not work against the interests of capital. Um, so I think um, those who suggest that there are many on the left really do not um, understand, you know, to put, it, to put it bluntly, do not understand the function of the border because free capital requires immobilized labor and that is precisely what the border is doing, right? Um, and also, again, it is limited, you know, when those like Sanders and others say that it, it is to it does not understand what a no border politics actually is. It's a misrepresentation of it because a no border politics is not the same as an open border politics An open border politics is very much. All right. Well, let's just open up the border and see what happens. Right. Um, but that's not what it's about, because the whole point of a no border politics is that forms of inequality should cease to exist. Right. The global north should not exist in relationship to the global south as a as a condition and as a place of extraction and exploitation. And over border politics, um, when it's brought up by leftists, conjures up the same kind of racist fears. Right. Well, if we open up the border, everyone's going to rush to come here. Right. Like that's the narrative. Everyone will rush to come here. Then there'll be a scarcity of jobs. Then there'll be a scarcity of resources. Then there'll be a scarcity of homes. But that presupposes that the North continues to exist as a site of immense wealth built on imperialism and exploitation, right? But what a no border politics is not just open up the border and the world remains as is. A no border politics is fundamentally about transforming all systems of exploitation and extraction such that you, you're not just talking about opening up the border. You're talking about transforming our entire political, economic, and social system. So that people aren't, frankly, rushing to, quote unquote, come here, right? Because the other flip side of that is we are here because you are there. We have to tackle the because you are there part of that politics in a no border politics. Um, so I, don't, I hope that answers the question. Um, but I absolutely think uh, the centrality of abolish ICE um, to a migrant justice movement is needed alongside the dismantling of all sites of bordering, right? Again, abolish ICE also requires us to abolish the outsourcing of borders, right? Out all the other agencies that are training and outsourcing violence. And it also means thinking about a no border politics, which is distinct from an open border politics. Well, those are all the questions we have. Thank you so much, Harsha, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for those great questions. I speak for everyone when I say it. it is really a privilege to hear you talk um, about your privilege ideas. To be here. Um, thank you to our audience for coming, our interested and engaged questions, um, of course, to our sponsors, and most importantly, to Harsha for being here with us. Thank you all thank so you much. All. all right, I think we're going to end the stream now. Take care, everybody.